Good evening, everyone. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Thank you for coming out on another beautiful night here in paradise. We actually are in paradise, right? Not in Las Vegas proper. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, Rob Lang and Caitlin Saladino, we want to welcome you. Also want to acknowledge our Greenspun College colleagues uh, giving us use of this facility. And as you can see, uh, the faculty and students are helping us record this event. It'll be up on our website. You'll be able to watch it on YouTube. Uh, we also get shown on local public television. So not only will the lecture be there, but Molly's PowerPoint will be there. So if you need to refer back to it, uh, it'll be available to you. Let me also thank our donors. Of course, nothing would be possible without our donors that include Barrett Gold, uh, Wolfgang Puck Enterprises, and even individuals such as Tom Kaplan and Brian Greenspun. And we're, if you are a regular or even semi-regular uh, attendee of our lectures, you hear me talk about how we try and bring you topical public policy issues. I think we have really outdone ourselves tonight. Uh, while in defense of our speaker, the, the global topic is on oversight of the House and the Congress, but I think we will touch on the impeachment issue as much as you may care to in your Q&A as well as in her talk. Uh, when I say we're responsible for that, by we I mean Caitlin Saladino, my colleague, and our, our speaker, Molly Reynolds. I had nothing to do with the fortuitous <laughs> scheduling of this, uh, but Molly has a history of coming out and seeing us at interesting times for the U.S. Congress. So we'll be careful when we schedule your next visit. Uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about Molly. She's a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings, where she studies Congress, with an emphasis on how congressional rules and procedures affect domestic policy outcomes. She's the author of a book, Exceptions to the Rule, The Politics of Filibuster Limitations in the U.S. Senate. And so her research projects include work on the oversight of the House of Representatives on congressional reform and the congressional budget process. She received her PhD in political science and public policy from the University of Michigan. I'm always especially happy to welcome a fellow Wolverine to campus. Uh, she got her AB in government from Smith College. And she, she served as an instructor at George Mason University. Uh, and she's also been very busy this week in a variety of UNLV classes from public policy to journalism to economics to political science, uh, as well as talking to students about internship opportunities they can have in, at Brookings and in Washington, D.C., and uh, how they might best pursue a career in public policy. So uh, Molly's also offered a, uh, authored a brief with us not too long ago uh, where she analyzed the 2018 midterm elections in our region back back in the, in the good old days, when <laughs> as far back as 2018. So she's been a great contributor to our program, and we look forward to her talk tonight. Great. Thank you, Bill. Thank you all for coming. Um, as Bill mentioned, I picked the topic for this lecture six months ago, um, but I do have a history of coming out um, to visit Las Vegas at very fortuitous times. Um, I was out here the week that Paul Ryan announced he was deciding to retire for being Speaker of the House, so who knows what will happen um, the next time I decide to come out. But I am going to talk about um, oversight in the House um, in this Congress. I'll touch on um, impeachment at the end, and we can talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like. But to start, I actually want to take us back to the 2018 election. So Bill mentioned that um, I did a, a policy brief for um, Brookings Mountain West on the 2018 election, but I want to present some different data from 2018. And I want us to think a little bit about what congressional candidates were actually talking about in the 2018 election. So this is some data on um, the topics that were covered in uh, television advertisements in um, federal races, so in races for House and Senate seats in 2018, as well as gubernatorial races at the end of the cycle, so between September 4th and Election Day. And you can see, not on this list anywhere, um, either ads in favor of Democratic candidates or in favor of Republican candidates are things like President Trump or investigations. So generally, what we were getting um, from candidates um, and from ads run 
in the 2018 campaigns were, were not about um, investigating the president. They were about topics like health care, which is um, far and away number one for pro-democratic um, ads, things like taxes, um, immigration for Republicans. If we look at data on um, mentions of the president um, in advertising, so these are um, ads that were on broadcast TV for just House and Senate races, again, towards the end of the 2018 midterm campaign. We can see that um, on the right there are the figures for 2018. We can see that only about 5% of ads referenced President Trump. Slightly more um, referenced him, excuse me, about 10% total, about 5% um, of ads that approve, mentioned him approvingly, about 5% um, uh, disapproving. Um, but if you compare that to previous um, midterm cycles, 2014, 2010, 2006, 2002, the president was actually, again, much less of a topic um, in the 2018 election than the equivalent presidents had been in previous midterms. So on one hand, we have this 2018 midterm campaign being conducted largely about other issues, not about the president. But at the same time, we see these headlines about what would happen if Democrats took control of the House. So this is one that just says, these Democrats could make Trump's life miserable if they win the House. It's from um, just before Election Day. Um, this is from August. A midterm victory would unleash congressional Democrats who are eager to investigate Trump. My personal favorite, which is also from August, Republicans secretly studying their coming hell if Republican, uh, excuse me, if Democrats take the House. So we have these kind of two storylines from the 2018 election that we have to hold together. What candidates were actually talking about, which was largely not investigating um, the president and the Trump administration, but also this notion that if they, if Democrats took the majority, this is what they would do. So kind of inspired by this, um, this dichotomy, I decided back in January to start a project that tried to systematically track what oversight was actually happening in the House once Democrats took control. What were they actually doing? What were they looking at? So that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about tonight. But I wanna start by just sort of making sure we're on the same page about what we mean when we say oversight. So this is a definition that comes from the Nonpartisan Congressional Research Service that just defines oversight as the review, monitoring, and supervision of the implementation of public policy. So again, this is pretty broad. It can cover lots of different kinds of behavior by the federal government that Congress might be looking at. Um, and it can, um, again, it may focus on federal programs, federal spending, federal activities. Um, what agencies are doing, how they're running programs. It may also focus on private sector activities. If we think of some of the kind of high profile famous examples of congressional oversight from recent decades, we might also remember things like the televised hearings that um, the House did on big tobacco, um, investing in the tobacco companies in the 90s. We might, if you're a sports fan, you might remember um, big congressional hearings on um, sports antitrust. Um, so sometimes Congress also looks into things that the private sector is doing to evaluate how well its policies that touch those industries um, are being implemented. Sometimes congressional oversight is routine. So a lot of times in the course of putting together the budget every year, Congress engages in routine examinations of federal programs to see how they're running, see where the money is going, or they may be driven by outside events like scandals. So we might be curious about where Congress's power to conduct this kind of oversight comes from. And it's fundamentally rooted in the Constitution, in Article I, um, the uh, portion of the Constitution that sets up Congress. Um, it's implied in the Constitution. There's not a place in the Constitution that specifically says Congress shall have the power to oversee the executive branch. But there's a whole range of other duties that the Constitution does prescribe for Congress. Um, that imply its ability to also conduct oversight. So things like Congress's power to appropriate money. Congress has the power of the purse. Um, Congress's power to enact laws. 
to raise and support an army and navy, to declare war, yes, to impeach um, the president. Again, we'll come back to that at the end. I mean, the idea is that Congress could not reasonably do these other responsibilities that it's given in Article I of the Constitution without knowing what the executive branch is doing, without knowing how programs are being administered, by whom, whether they're being administered in compliance with Congress's legislative intent. So that, that's sort of the constitutional framework that underlies Congress's oversight powers. And then within that, the um, Congress's oversight powers have been um, backed up by a series of important court cases. So one of these that I reference in the upper left-hand corner here is a case called McGrain versus um, Daughtery from 1927, where um, the Supreme Court holds that um, the power of congressional inquiry is essential and appropriate um, as an auxiliary to Congress's legislative function, that um, it's not just that Congress is supposed to draft legislation, it's also that Congress is supposed to evaluate um, how agencies are performing their duties. In 1957, the court holds in Watkins versus the United States that um, Congress's oversight power encompasses inquiries involving existing laws as well as inquiries that might suggest new laws that Congress um, could pass. Um, in a case from 2008 um, involving um, former uh, White House counsel Harriet Myers and her um, willingness or unwillingness to comply with a congressional subpoena, um, a federal court said that Congress's power of inquiry is derived from its Article I function, so this box that I've drawn around the outside. Importantly though, Congress's oversight power is not limitless. It's not the case that Congress can look at anything. Um, Congress doesn't have the authority to expose the private affairs of individuals without some justification within Congress's legislative function. And Congress needs to balance its investigations with individuals' constitutional rights, and importantly, um, and as we're seeing now, with claims of presidential executive privilege. So when Congress engages in oversight, what are the tools that it has available to it? So one that I'll talk a little bit about tonight are letters. So congressional committees can send letters to the executive branch, to other actors, um, whether they be state governments, whether they be private, um, uh, private firms, that sort of thing, requesting information about um, uh, various, uh, again, implementation choices that agencies are making, how they're conducting themselves. Um, sometimes they request specific documents. They may request the appearance of someone um, at a congressional hearing. So I think hearings are often, when we think of Congress doing investigations, we think of hearings as um, the kind of cornerstone of that. And they can be really important, but they're not necessarily designed or well-equipped to get new information. So if you've ever watched a congressional hearing, um, particularly in um, recent years, you'll see that the way they proceed is there's one or more witnesses. The witnesses usually get to make an opening statement and then there's periods of questioning back and forth, five minutes per member going between members of the majority party and the members of the minority party. And that's not a terribly, that's not a format that's terribly conducive to uncovering a lot of new information. What hearings can do is they can publicly highlight or shame bad behavior. They're pretty good at doing that. And they can also get uh, individuals on the record claiming they did things or didn't do things or promising things um, that they might do in the future. Congress also has the power to conduct depositions. So um, interviews with individuals behind closed doors, um, often under oath, where they, again, might inquire as to how um, a particular policy is being implemented or um, how a particular choice was made. The ability to get information and to make witnesses appear in any of these contexts are backed up by Congress's power to issue subpoenas and by Congress's power to hold individuals in contempt if they don't comply with a congressional subpoena. Um, there are three avenues um, of contempt that um, Congress can pursue, and you may have heard discussion of one or more of these in the news this year. 
Um, one is a criminal contempt statute that basically says if someone is issued a subpoena, um, either for their own testimony or to turn over documents, and that they don't do so, they um, can be subject to criminal prosecution. The challenge for Congress with using um, the criminal contempt statute to pursue oversight of the executive branch is that it is the policy, a, a long-standing policy of um, presidential administrations of both parties, that the executive branch will not prosecute a contempt citation um, if the person who's being accused of um, contempt is acting on instructions from the president um, because the president is exerting executive privilege. So you can, Congress can hold someone in contempt under the criminal contempt statute, but to actually enforce that requires action by the US attorney in Washington, DC, and the Justice Department has said that attorney will not prosecute these cases if the person being held in contempt um, is um, acting under the direction of the president to claim executive privilege. Congress also has something called inherent contempt power, which um, is sort of what it sounds like. It's Congress's ability to hold someone in contempt without having to go um, to the courts. And in the 19th century, this sometimes involved literally finding the person that Congress was trying to hold in contempt and bringing them and physically holding them in the Capitol complex um, as if in jail. Um, Congress hasn't used this particular power since the early 20th century when it sort of considered it unseemly. Um, it also doesn't um, necessarily, the, um, it's not a, a terribly long-term solution um, to, to hold someone um, um, in Congress's own custody. Um, there's some discussion about whether Congress could use its inherent contempt power to levy fines against people who are not complying with subpoenas. Um, there are legal arguments for and against that, but Congress hasn't actually tried that. There's some people who advocate for doing so now. The third avenue Congress has available to it, and um, this is an avenue Congress is pursuing at this point, is that if someone does not comply with a subpoena, Congress can pursue a course of civil action in the courts to try to get the courts to require the person to comply. This is, for example, what is currently happening with former White House Chief of Staff Don McGahn, who was um, out of compliance with a congressional subpoena. Um, the House of Representatives has sued in court, in civil court, as opposed to um, criminal proceedings, to try to get the courts to force McGahn to comply. Um, Congress also has sort of an architecture beyond just its, in, its own internal workings to support its oversight um, activities, things like the Government Accountability Office. So if there's a specific program that Congress would like an investigation of, it might also um, consult with um, things like the GAO to perform that audit. So with this background, what are we actually seeing committees in the House do in this Congress? So this is a graph um, of House hearings, of hearings that have happened in the House of Representatives. So this all comes from data that um, me and my research team at Brookings have collected. And so you can see off across the bottom, um, different months, starting in January and going um, until um, September. The blue bars are, are portions of the bars, are hearings that House committees have had that are not oversight. So there are lots of other kinds of things that a House committee might explore in a hearing. They might have a hearing about a particular piece of proposed legislation. They might have a hearing um, that just considers a policy problem broadly and asks experts to weigh in on potential solutions. But we're really curious about what are the hearings they're doing that specifically examine um, decisions and um, choices made by the executive branch um, in the first two years of the Trump administration. So those you see across the bottom in the darker portions of the bars. The tops of the bars are the percentage of all hearings that are captured by that bottom um, black part. So that's varied over the months. It's, um, you know, the sort of highest level is about 28% of hearings at a given month are oversight. That's not a lot. Um, but what it reflects, again, is this, um, as I described before, that hearings aren't necessarily the most effective tool for trying to uncover new information about something that the executive branch might be doing now or might have been doing um, in the past two years. If we look, however, at letters, so these are letters sent by House committees to either executive branch agencies or individuals with knowledge of what 
um, might have been happening in an executive branch agency or inside the White House. Um, here we see the balance tipped much more in favor of um, oversight. So many more of these letters that committees are sending to try and get information are really targeted at trying to oversee and investigate the operations of the executive branch over the first two years of the Trump administration and during um, this current year. In a perfect world, I would have data that would tell us what this looks like in comparison to other presidential administrations. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, this data is relatively labor intensive to collect. Um, it involves um, visiting um, different uh, official websites of House committees, I'm um, taking down all of the information about letters and hearings that they provide. Um, I have a team of um, individuals who work with me who um, examine the hearings and the letters to determine whether they meet this definition of oversight that we have developed um, to put them, I'll talk about kind of policy areas that these fall into in a second. Um, but it's, um, it's a pretty time intensive process and so we have a pretty good picture for this year and we'll have a pretty good picture for next year, but don't unfortunately have a great um, ability to compare it to previous years. <coughs> what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit, so I've given you kind of an overview and talked at a pretty high level. I'd like to now give you kind of an example of how these different pieces fit together. Letters and hearings and threats of subpoenas and actual subpoenas and public hearings and private interviews. What does this all look like when um, you combine it into one investigation? So I want to start with um, a quote that I actually think captures the general historical dy dynamic of congressional oversight pretty well, which is from Tom Davis, who is a Republican member of the House from Virginia, who was the chair of the Oversight Committee in the House, which is one of the committees that engages in a lot of this oversight activity between 2003 and 2007. And he says that traditionally, this stuff, so when Congress wants uh, someone to appear as a witness or when Congress asks for some documents, traditionally this stuff gets negotiated. The way he put it is that Congress asks for the moon and they end up with a moon rock. They sort of go bold, they say these are all the things that we want, these are all the documents we want, these are all the questions we want answered. And they don't get everything, but they get something. But as Davis points out, that that dynamic has broken down a little bit in um, the current Congress. We'll see in a second, it's not broken down entirely, and I'll walk you through an example, but that this process by which both sides try to negotiate and come to some sort of agreement that's acceptable to both of them um, has, um, we've seen that not work as effectively in this Congress as perhaps in previous Congresses. So I want to walk us through an example involving an investigation that the House Oversight Committee has done into um, the Trump administration's use of interim security clearances. So in 2017, um, news reports break that the White House may be using more of these um, interim security clearances, basically granting individuals who work in the White House the ability to see and use classified information um, on um, an interim basis without doing a full investigation. So there's some media reports that there's um, an unusual, um, unusually high amount of use um, of these kinds of procedures um, and clearances happening um, in the House. The first letter that we actually see from the Oversight Committee go to the White House about this happens while Republicans still control the Oversight Committee in 2017. So the um, chair of the House Oversight Committee in 2017, Trey Gowdy, um, sends a letter to then White House Chief of Staff John Kelly asking for information about this, um, these reports to um, get documents to see and evaluate whether um, the these reports are accurate. In 2018, once um, control of the House has shifted from Republicans to the Democrats, um, the new Democratic leadership of the House Oversight Committee kind of picks back up this investigation, requests more information from the White House. The White House um, responds that this security clearance investigation does not have a quote, legitimate legislative purpose. That the House Oversight Committee can't 
identify, says the White House, a reason why getting this information about the White House's security clearance practices would further the development of new legislation. So um, here we see, and I've sort of tried to color code these, so we have first in kind of the, the aqua color, um, an outside event that prompts some congressional oversight. Then we have this exchange of letters between the two branches. We then see later in 2018, um, a staffer from the White House, a whistleblower basically, testify before the House Oversight Committee on this question of what procedures the um, uh, White House was actually using. So now we've gotten a hearing that's come out of this exchange of letters. After that hearing, the Oversight Committee feels like it doesn't have enough information from the White House still, and so it issues a subpoena to former White House Personnel Security Director Carl Klein. So we've gone again through, we've seen a number of tools here. Um, initially, the White House threatens to block Klein's testimony, says he won't comply with the subpoena. But then the committee and um, the White House reach an agreement that Klein will appear for a private interview as opposed to for in a public hearing. So here we see again how these different pieces fit together, how these different tools in Congress's toolbox can help it get certain information, even if it's not all of the information at once, even if it requires accommodation on both sides. This is, again, generally how this process um, unfolds. So what um, issues has the House been looking at um, in this Congress? So this is a graph of um, oversight hearings, again, by policy area. Um, and you can see that we've categorized all of the hearings that we've looked at into um, a number of different policy areas. We have trade, agriculture, and economic issues, which is the most frequent um, topic of oversight hearings. Defense and foreign policy, energy and the environment, healthcare, immigration, um, government operations and ethics, technology and transportation, um, criminal justice and the rule of law, that is where most of the hearings that you would think of that have been kind of closely identified with the unfolding um, impeachment inquiry fall under. Domestic social programs and race and civil rights. If you're curious sort of what falls under this trade, ec agriculture, and economic issues category such that it is the, the highest ranking one, um, one thing that is in that category that's seen a lot of oversight hearings is um, natural disaster relief policy. So the House has actually conducted um, a fair number of hearings on the administration's response to things like um, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, um, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, that sort of thing. So that falls into that category. Um, and there have also been a number of specific agencies whose operations fall into that category that have had a fair amount of oversight, like the Treasury Department, the IRS, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, that sort of thing. Other um, issues that fall into some of these categories that you might have heard um, a little bit about uh, Congress doing investigations into in the energy environment, environment category that includes attempts to roll back environmental regulations. Healthcare includes things like how the Trump administration has been implementing Obamacare. Immigration involves things um, including um, operations and policy at the border. If we look at letters, on the other hand, we see here that the most frequent topic of letters is this criminal justice and the rule of law category. And there, a lot of that content is this investigation um, ongoing, taking a number of different forms that has um, kind of proceeded where we currently are in the impeachment inquiry. The government operations and ethics category is number two. Um, that includes things like um, various investigations of um, uh, cabinet officials um, and their potential conflicts of interest, um, that sort of thing. But then again, even with those kind of headline grabbing things getting the most attention in terms of letters that committees have sent, you still see things like energy and the environment, healthcare, domestic social programs, also being the target of a lot of requests for information by Congress from the executive branch. In some cases, Congress has taken, um, the House has taken a um, 
somewhat more expansive role uh, approach to try to get some of this information. So for example, um, there's an investigation ongoing in the House about um, student loan servicers. And so how do um, individual student loans get serviced and what's the interaction between both private loan servicers and um, the Department of Education in that context. So that's the kind of thing that um, is being looked at in some of these other issue areas. So we might also want to know something about kind of how good the oversight is. Is it um, the kind of oversight that we might attach to flashy um, viral videos from hearings? Um, or is it more substantive, really trying to dig into information about what's happening in the executive branch? This is actually a pretty hard question to answer. Um, but one thing that we can look at is we can ask, are the issues that Congress is doing a lot of oversight on also the issues that are most important to the public? So we know from um, polling that the Gallup organization has done for decades and decades where they ask um, Americans in a survey every month kind of what's the most important problem facing the country. So we have a, a sense from that data that's pretty good over time uh, as to what um, kind of average Americans care about. And so we can take that data and we can combine it with the data I've shown you about oversight. We can get a sense of is Congress matching the public's priorities. And so these bars um, are again sort of total oversight activity, so combining hearings and letters together um, um, on different issues. And then the little triangles um, show you the percentage of people on these Gallup polls saying that they think each of these policy areas is the most important problem facing the country. So if there was a perfect relationship between um, where Congress was devoting its attention and what the public thought was the most important problem, we would see sort of a line with the, the bars would trend that way, the triangles would also trend that way. We don't quite see that, but we do see some places where it matches up pretty well. So things like the amount of, the relative amount of activity um, that Congress is devoting to looking at government operations and ethics matches you know, more or less the relative focus that the public has on that problem. Um, there are some places like the kind of economic issues where the public thinks what well, Congress um, thinks that that policy area is more important than the amount of attention Congress is devoting to it. And then there are other areas like the, um, the criminal justice and the rule of law area, which again involves um, some of what's involved there is what's informed the impeachment investigation, where the public rates that less important than Congress does. Um, and again, that is consistent with what I talked about at the beginning in terms of the focus of what we saw in the 2018 elections. So that's um, for better or worse, just not where a lot of the public's um, attention is. So a couple of lessons that I draw from this data and from Congress's experience with um, oversight in the 116th Congress. So I'm going to touch on sort of two things here. One is that in doing this work, in conducting these hearings and sending these letters, Congress has had, particularly for a lot of the very high profile oversight that it's been engaging in, the House has had to rely pretty heavily on legal strategies to try and get documents, interviews, and um, uh, witness appearances from the executive branch. That can be useful, but it can also be quite slow. And I'll give you an example of that in a second. Congress has also, I think, learned that there are other changes in the legislative process that have happened that have made it more difficult for it to use some other legislative tools in pursuit of its ability to um, oversee the executive branch. And I'll talk about that as well. So this question about the speed of um, using legal strategies to back up um, oversight um, efforts. So I, I, again, I mentioned that Congress can write letters, Congress can hold hearings, Congress can conduct depositions, but that sometimes it needs either the threat of legal action or actual legal action to back that up. And so this is an example of one case in which Congress has gone to court to try to supplement um, its oversight activities. And this is a, a case, um, Trump versus the um, House Committee on Oversight and Reform. And this case 
comes out of a subpoena that the Oversight Committee issued to an accounting firm um, called Mazars, which holds some of the financial records of the Trump Organization. Um, the House Oversight Committee issued this subpoena um, in April um, after Trump's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, testified before the committee. It was what we call a friendly subpoena. So Mazars, the accounting firm, actually um, the Oversight Committee had asked Mazars to turn over the records voluntarily. Mazars had s said, we can't turn them over voluntarily. Um, that would be against um, our practices and our reading um, of the law. But if you subpoena us, we will turn them over in compliance with the subpoena. Um, Trump, um, in his personal capacity, has sued to prevent Mazars from complying with that subpoena. So the subpoena in this case is issued in um, April. Um, about a week later, um, the case is filed. Again, Trump in his personal capacity sues to prevent the accounting firm from complying with the subpoena. This case is first heard in federal court in mid-May, at which point the federal judge who hears the case says, we're gonna expedite this case. We're gonna decide it as fast as possible. So this is like the best case scenario for the House going to court to try to use the courts to get information that it's not getting um, absent court action. So the case is first heard in May. There are arguments heard on appeal um, in, in the middle of July, and we're still waiting for a decision. So even in a world where the, the federal judges involved have said we're gonna try and decide this as quickly as possible, we're still not, uh, we still don't have a decision in this case. So using, um, using the courts can be a really slow process to try and get um, material for the house um, that uh, it's trying to get. These are just another, this is a, um, a list of other important court cases that again, um, Congress has been litigating and um, we're still waiting for resolution on. So there's a separate case involving other Trump um, organization financial records held by Deutsche Bank and Capital One that we're waiting for a decision on. The case um, involving the House Ways and Means Committee um, attempting to obtain Trump's tax returns is pending a decision. That decision is supposed to come sometime after September 30th, so it could come any day now. Um, the case involving um, the House's efforts to get the Mueller grand jury materials um, was filed in July. We'll have its next hearing, um, I guess, next week. Um, the hearing, um, the next hearing in the case um, trying to force former White House counsel Don McGahn to comply with his congressional subpoena is not till the end of October. So again, Congress can use the courts um, and use its legal powers to back up its ability to do oversight, but that process isn't particularly fast. The other thing that I think we've learned from this current Congress is that Congress used to have some other tools that it could also use to try to threaten the executive branch into giving it more information and um, making people um, appear for um, interviews and for hearings that thanks to other changes in how Congress works have become less effective. So Congress um, has the power of the purse, has the power to write um, appropriations bills that spend federal dollars. Now, however, increasingly that process unfolds with big giant spending bills that pass just before the government might shut down if Congress doesn't do anything, um, which really raises the stakes of passing them. They become much more kind of must pass bills and if they don't, the consequences of not passing them are much greater because they fund sort of large amounts of federal operations. And that makes it much harder for Congress to engage in really specific fights as parts of those spending bills where they might say, all right, we've asked for these documents, we've asked for compliance from this official with a request. If we don't get it, we're going to cut funding for that agency, or we're gonna cut funding for a particular program. And it's much harder to have those very specific fights when the bill in question is huge and the consequences of not passing it right now are that the government is gonna shut down. It's also the case that Congress used to have um, more ability to push back against specific actions by the executive branch um, using what we call the legislative veto. 
So basically, Congress could write a law that says, all right, the president can do X, Y, or Z, but we're going to make that action subject to congressional review. And if we pass a resolution that says we want to disapprove of what the president has done, that stops him from doing that. Thanks to a Supreme Court case um, in the 1980s, um, the legislative veto was ruled unconstitutional. So the Supreme Court said that Congress can't just on its own um, overturn the action, um, an action of the executive branch. And so this has limited Congress's ability to do things like disapprove of the president's declaration of a national emergency on the southern border. Um, in the 1970s, when Congress originally designed the national emergencies law, it gave itself the power to overturn the declaration of a national emergency um, if it didn't agree with what the president had done. But thanks to this abolition of the legislative veto, it's really been limited in its ability to do that. So now, as promised, and before we go to Q&A, a few words on impeachment. So impeachment is one of Congress's oversight tools. Um, it is reserved I think, for unusual circumstances, um, but it, it falls in this toolbox of things that Congress um, can do to try to oversee the actions of the executive. It involves constitutionally prescribed roles for both the House and the Senate, but leaves a fair amount of detail, as we're now learning, um, left to be determined about how um, impeachment actually operates, left to be determined by each chamber. So in the House, it was once the case that there were certain powers given to congressional committees in the context of impeachment inquiries that were kind of special powers. They were things that um, congressional committees didn't usually get to do. So congressional committees didn't, as a matter of course, used to have the power to subpoena witnesses. That's a relatively modern development. Um, Historically, committees could seek the power to subpoena witnesses, but they would have to go to the full house and ask for, the full, for a vote of the full house to grant that subpoena power. Now, thanks to changes um, in the house rules, that um, power is something that all house committees now have as a matter of course. They don't have to seek special authorization for subpoena power. The same is true of the ability to have staff conduct depositions. That used to be something that congressional committees would need special authorization to do. It is now something that congressional committees, the power that they have as a matter of course. So there are some elements of um, the current debate over um, whether, to, um, whether we are engaged in an official impeachment inquiry or not that um, are a little bit confusing because of these changes um, in, the broader, um, in the broader rules of the House. Because um, a number of these powers that the House used to need to give the Judiciary Committee in the context of conducting an impeachment inquiry, because the committee now has those um, as a routine matter and doesn't need to seek permission from the House to get them, um, the House has not taken a vote of the full House on whether to formally initiate an impeachment inquiry. Yes, Nancy Pelosi gave a press conference last week where um, she said that the House was now in an official impeachment inquiry, uh, but the House hasn't actually voted on that question. Does this matter? We're not sure yet. Um, some of these court cases that I've described particularly the case um, involving the House's attempt to get the Mueller grand jury materials, may hinge on whether courts think that the House can be in an impeachment inquiry without having taken a vote of the full House or not. And so for me, this is kind of a big outstanding question of where we are right now. Would a federal court recognize what the House is doing um, right now as a formal impeachment inquiry? And as a result, would they um, be more willing to turn over the Mueller grand jury materials? And would they speed up any of these cases on which they're moving quite slowly? 
In the Senate, the fact that there's a fair amount of flexibility under the Constitution in terms of what an impeachment trial actually looks like means that under the current rules of the Senate, it's probably not possible for Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to simply ignore altogether a set of articles of impeachment should they come over from the House. Um, but it's probably the case, and again I say probably because some of this is uncharted territory, that um, McConnell could st structure the um, proceedings of a trial in a way that would be more advantageous to Republicans um, in the chamber. Part of why we don't entirely know um, how this might unfold is because of the um, three times that, um, this being the third, that in the 20th century that Congress has considered impeaching and trying a president. This is the first one that's happened with different parties controlling the two chambers of Congress. So in 1973 and 1974, Democrats controlled both chambers and there was a Republican in the White House. In 1998 and 1999, Republicans controlled both chambers and there was a Democrat in the White House. But we have this divided party control right now which overlays a certain amount of partisan conflict on top of these questions um, of impeachment. The other reason why it's difficult to know exactly how the Senate might proceed, again, is because um, the most recent example we have of a presidential impeachment, the Clinton episode, um, the Senate actually came together before they started the trial they put literally all 100 senators in a room and they hashed out this question of what should the trial look like? What can we basically get all 100 senators to agree on as a procedure in terms of timing, how long we're going to question witnesses, when we're going to finish, when we're gonna vote, that sort of thing. Actually, it wasn't pretty, but they figured out how to do it with agreement of all 100 senators. The idea of something like that happening in the current Senate um, is pretty hard to imagine. I suppose it's not impossible, but um, I try not to make predictions, but the idea of all 100 senators coming together and setting a set of consensus procedures for an impeachment trial of President Trump, should it come to that, is, um, is a, a pretty difficult idea for me to get my head around. So we really don't know exactly what this might look like. But the sort of takeaway I um, would leave you with is that, um, it is uh, almost certainly the case that the Senate would have to do something in response to um, impeachment articles coming over from the House. What exactly that is and what exactly that looks like remains to be seen. So I will stop there. We've got 10 minutes for questions um, and I'm happy to take questions on um, anything I've talked about. Yes. Enter into yeah, so the, so whether impeachment or any of the other. Mm -hmm. So the, the biggest place that we see executive privilege um, enter into this whole um, oversight landscape is on issues where the president claims executive privilege as a way of per, of trying to prevent um, either an agency or someone in the White House from turning over documents or from um, submitting to an interview. And we've seen that happen repeatedly, not just during this administration, but during previous administrations. Um, those are the kinds of cases that often end up being litigated in court. So I mentioned that one of the reasons that it, um, Congress uh, has trouble using, its, using the criminal contempt statute is because the um, Justice Department will not prosecute criminal contempt cases against someone who is not complying with a subpoena because the president is claiming executive privilege. So those adjudicating that question of executive privilege um, um, often ends up in court. Sometimes, again, we see compromises um, behind the scenes on, okay, Congress will say, we will have someone in for an interview, we won't ask them about these things on which the president is claiming executive privilege, but we will ask them about these other things. And so um, that's another place where it comes into play, but it's certainly an important undercurrent that's um, kind of running under a lot of this, um, this debate. Yes? No, oh, follow up, it would seem that in the case of impeachment, you know, if the guy says, you know, 
Monica can testify because of executive privilege, that's the end of the story. Great. So one of the um, but there's a constitution. <laughs> Right, so one of, um, I was mentioning before this question of will courts and do courts decide some of these legal questions differently under the context of an impeachment inquiry than they might under the context of kind of regular congressional oversight. I think executive privilege is one place where we might see that. Exactly what that looks like in a particular case is really hard to know. Again, in part because we don't have that many precedents in the impeachment um, arena to specifically look at. Yeah. So when Congress is taking up some form of oversight over a policy issue, does yeah. it need to be attached to a specific piece of legislation, or can it like proceed legislation to figure out what to do in an area? That's exactly right. So one of the things that this series of federal court decisions that kind of undergird um, the oversight uh, apparatus is this idea that Congress can be doing oversight in the context of a specific piece of legislation or it can be doing so in order to learn what it needs to know to develop legislation in the future. And what exactly that means is something that the two sides, Congress and the executive branch, often contest. So some of these court cases in the current Congress that I mentioned um, that are being litigated currently um, the House and the executive branch take really different views of what it means to be potentially developing legislation to address a policy problem. Um, and so, you know, there are, um, uh, there's um, investigations that uh, the House is doing that where the executive branch says, this is really targeting President Trump personally, and the House says, no, we are excuse me, trying to get this information so that we can, say, write better anti-corruption laws, for example. Yes? Uh, I'm curious to know what's going to happen to the CIA whistleblower and whether knowing that person's identity would <coughs> help um, the House Judiciary Committee really get the power, actually get something from those subpoenas at the so I have no idea what's going to happen with this CIA whistleblower. Um, I don't necessarily think, so most of the, um, so one of the um, important developments that did happen last week when Speaker Pelosi um, um, sort of signaled that the impeachment inquiry was moving into a new phase is that she indicated that while much of what had been um, going on to inform potential impeachment had been happening in the Judiciary Committee, that now they were bringing under, I believe the word she used, is the umbrella of an impeachment inquiry work by f not just the Judiciary Committee, but by five other congressional committees as well, one of which is the House Intelligence Committee, which is the one that's handling the whistleblower um, complaint and the sort of subsequent events related to that. Um, I, we're starting to see exactly how the Intelligence Committee is pursuing information in that case. I don't necessarily think that knowing the identity of the whistleblower would strengthen their hand in court at all. Um, but how exactly any of that plays out um, remains to be seen. Who knows what's happened in the last hour that I've been um, up here talking. That is an occupational hazard of talking about um, oversight and impeachment in the current moment, that I can say something and things will have changed by the time I finish my talk. <laughs> um, but we'll see. Yes, sir. Uh, two things uh, where Congress has acted. Mm -hmm. um, Congress has acted uh, with regard to marijuana. Mm -hmm. The law still remains on the book. It's a controlled substance. And states have um, acted differently with regard to it, which sets up a conflict, which can cause all kinds of problems in terms of enforcement. Um, uh, but the executive has a duty to execute the laws, but the laws are on the books. Mm -hmm. um, immigration laws have been passed by Congress. <coughs> and the duty of the executive is to enforce the laws that are in the books. And again, the states have sort of taken an opposite view. They've created sanctuary cities and, 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 
kind of inhibited or uh, failed, failed to engage in cooperation uh, with uh, ICE. Uh, my question is, are there, are there, don't, doesn't Congress have an interest in seeing to it that the laws that they pass, in fact, are being properly executed? And are there any hearings or letters um, that effectively address these issues in terms of the actions of the executive? So um, I can't, as I showed you in um, these graphs, there's a lot of oversight activity happening. There's a, um, a part of your question that's really important, I think, um, which is about whether Congress sees itself, how it sees itself institutionally as a branch that's meant to act as a counterweight to the executive branch. And whether um, there's a shared institutional sense of defending the prerogatives of Congress against an executive branch that's making certain choices. And I think that is something we've really seen atrophy in Congress over time. That um, if we go back to the 70s, there was a much stronger sense in Congress that Congress was um, sort of an institution um, that had equal weight to the executive branch and had an institutional responsibility to check what the executive branch was doing. And I think now we see much more um, oversight activity, even oversight on genuine policy questions, be motivated much more by disagreements between the parties um, on the conduct of federal policy than we did in earlier parts of the 20th century. That's not to say, say that Oversight has never been partisan. Um, there is some pretty good political science work that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century that shows that we see more oversight of the executive branch by Congress when they're controlled by different parties. But I do think there's been some diminishment of a sense of institutional responsibility on the part of Congress to push back against executive power for the sake of trying to be seen as an equal branch of government. If there's someone who hasn't asked, yeah. one. as far as the now new thing that is routine of them being yeah. able to do depositions mm -hmm. and them doing inquiries, how did that start? That they all of a sudden have this now? Yeah, so it's evolved somewhat slowly over time. So it started actually around the same, um, like during the Watergate era. So that was, I was talking before about institutional kind of power and institutional prerogatives. And Congress realized that during the, um, the Watergate period, not just in the context of the Watergate investigation, but in the context of other uses of executive power by Nixon, that it needed to be a little bit more flexible in how congressional committees were able to conduct oversight. So that's kind of where this started. And then it's evolved slowly over time with each party when they've come into the majority periodically in the House saying, we want to give our committees a little bit more authority to do this work on their own rather than having to get special authorization from the House to do it. So it, it dates to the early 70s and then has um, evolved um, uh, over time since then. Thank you. I want to be respectful of your time, although I hate to cut off our discussion. Uh, thank you, Molly, for a very <laughs> deep dive into this topic. Thank you all for joining us and for your great questions. Molly will be around if you have an unasked question or two. Uh, I hope you can join us in two weeks where we change the topic rather dramatically and we'll have a, a colleague uh, on, who's a foreign policy expert out, Tamara Witties, who has given us the rather intriguing topic of can the United States escape the Middle East? No less baby. Uh. <laughs> So uh, I hope you can join us. That would be two weeks from tonight, although we'll be starting at 7 p.m. that night. So uh, mark your calendars if you can join us. We hope we see you. Thanks again. Thank you.